Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. I'm so pleased to have my guest today, a gentleman who wrote a book that I always want to read. The name of the book is called A Handbook for Humans, written by Jim Sloman. Thank you for sitting with me today and speaking to me about this book. You're welcome. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. Wonderful. How did you come across this book? Why did you write this book? Um, it was basically because of the Boy Scouts. Uh, when you join the Boy Scouts, they give you a Boy Scout manual. And in this manual, it tells you everything that you need to know about being a Boy Scout, like how to make a fire in the woods and how to cook your meal in the woods and how to protect against incense, insects and everything. You know, it's all right there in this manual. <laughs> and I later on I remember thinking gosh you know I, they ought to give us a manual for life when we're born or something you know a, a handbook for humans that, that tells us what we need to know in various areas like spirituality or how to get what you want or relationships or uh, diet or how to deal with negativity or whatever it might be uh, all in one place where it all deals with these different dimensions and uh, gives you some kind of insight as to you know how to operate in those dimensions uh, things that you might otherwise take a long time and, and uh, many uh, trial and error experiences to learn and I was a particularly slow learner in mm. many areas so um, finally, I thought, well, I couldn't find, I kept looking for a handbook for humans, and I couldn't find one, so, I mean, there were books that dealt with relationships, or books that dealt with consciousness, or books that dealt with, you know, all sorts of different specialized subjects, um, but I was looking for something that really would cover the gamut, you know, that, of all these different dimensions, so, I decided to write it finally. Since I couldn't find it, I thought I'd write it and give it to myself. Indeed you did, and thank you so much. You're welcome. Your book was, seems to draw from a lot of uh, masters and avatars. All through the chapters, you mention so many different people who have walked this path of, of great, deep realization and understanding. And to name a few of the different masters that you talk about in all the different chapters, and you so beautifully and, and crafted the book where you break it down into all these different sections of the inner and the outer of of oneself, and talking about basically showing people about what it is of their mind and their emotions and how to work with all of that. Always talking about these different masters that it inspired you. I went on a terrific search. Victoria. Uh, I came out of a difficult childhood and um, so I went on this very intense search. I was very unhappy, very depressed, I would say suicidal. Um, uh, so I, I started, when I was 13 I started studying philosophy, you know. I went to Sunday school from the age of 6 to the age of 12 and, you know, studied all that. and. Then I went into philosophy, and then I went into psychology, and um, finally I went on this very intense spiritual search where uh, anybody who said they had the answer, you know, I went and did their thing, and I went to India, I went to Japan, I went all over the U.S., I went everywhere I possibly could, you know, if, if they said, you know, stand on your head and turn around three times, I did it. You know, if they said meditate this way, I did it. Uh, whatever they said to do, I did it. And I immersed myself in it. And I, it was very intense search. I really wanted to get to the bottom of things. Like, what are we doing here? What's, what's this all about? What's going on here? Um, how can we be happy? <clears throat> and more important than how can we be happy is kind of, um, What's the best way to live our life? You know, we have a certain amount of time, a certain amount of energy. We have this body. Uh, we're born into a very interesting time. Um, 
where do we put our attention? What do we do? What, you know, what's it all about? I, I didn't want to just, you know, basically what the implicit message of society is, you know, is chase after things, you know, mm -hmm. chase after the right relationship, chase after money, chase after fame, power, wealth, whatever it might be, pleasure. Um, I didn't want to just do that and then come to the end of my life and go, well, gee, what was that all about? And then you're out. Right. You know, I wanted to see if I could, um, what's going on? What's going on here you know, at a deep level? And so I kept searching and searching and searching. And uh, ultimately, Handbook for Humans came out of that. And that's why I mentioned so many people, because I honor so many people they, you know there's we've we're very fortunate to live in a time when not only are there very many great teachers of, of different modalities and different things but um, also that we have access to these teachers you know the time was when a book had to be copied out by hand and they were very rare and you know, let's say we lived in the 1300s, it was almost impossible to find out about, say, Eastern religions or uh, Middle Eastern religions or you know, whatever. We're very fortunate in the sense that we have tremendous access. We can go travel and be with Master so-and-so, or we can have access to all these different books and now DVDs and audio recordings and what have you. It's a very, very fortunate time to be alive because we have so much access. And I immersed myself in that access. I really did. I, I went and just, it was like a smorgasbord. What anybody had to offer that I thought was genuine, I, you know, I, I looked into it and tried to benefit from it. And then um, tried to give back in whatever little way I could. So, Handbook sometimes tries to synthesize all that. And uh, whether I've done a good job or not, I don't know, but I, I did my very, very best to try to synthesize all those different things and all those different dimensions into something that was comprehensible and clear and simple. And I put it through 25 drafts, 25 mm. drafts, to try to get it to the point where it really might have a chance to be clear and simple and understandable to anyone. One of the stories that stood out in the book was the taking of the LSD story. And you did the LSD, not that we're saying that people need to do drugs or should run out and do take drugs to have this experience, but it really spoke to me on a level of understanding that we are in society in this times now that's known as degenerate times right now and everybody's into consumerism and everybody is living a way now that is very robotic they're not really feeling their their own energy they've given their power over to basically just walking around in in, in this kind of a lostness and in that basically you they're not feeling their own feelings. So if you're not feeling your own feelings, and on top of that, what, what happens from that is then a resistance, which was the experience of the LSD. As I recall that you wrote about that you were having this bad trip on the LSD, and the trip was gonna get worse if you continued thinking that, and what was making you have a bad trip in the LSD was your resistance. So all of a sudden you surrendered to not resisting Right. And you came out the other side of it knowing that basically it showed you that's what you have been doing all your life. You've been in this resistance stage of keeping life away from you, keeping your feelings away from you, numbing up as we all do, most do in society here. It's, it's, it's the smallest percentage of people that are really, really living. They feel like they're living because in all intents and purposes, they're standing up, they're walking around, they're talking. They have a mirage of, of emotions and feelings, but really, are they really owning those feelings? 
I can't speak for anybody else because I, I honor their own sacred path and, and I really feel like um, everybody knows what's best for them at some deep level. And it's not for me to judge that. Right. But in this, uh, this was in 1973. It was the first time I had ever taken a hallucinogenic drug. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with a group of people, all of whom were experienced with LSD. This was in a commune. And uh, so we all took it and then went for a walk in the woods. And the drug came on. And they were sort of walking in a group ahead of me in the woods. And I sort of fell behind because something very strange was happening to me. And uh, they got about several hundred yards ahead of me and I suddenly realized I was dying I was dying it, it was it was so you know this this force was taking over my body and um, I was about to die and I didn't want to die you know I thought this isn't the right time you know let's do it some other time mm -hmm. and uh, but I had a moment of grace there where uh, I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to die, let me surrender to this. And at least before I die, let this, whatever this is, this experience, let it teach me whatever it wants to teach me before I die. If I'm going to die anyway, why not let go and surrender into it? Which turns out to be a, a really wonderful lesson about life itself um, and as soon as I let go and said okay teach me what you want to teach me it flipped and instead of becoming this horrible trip it became this really really beautiful trip and I what I learned from that was exactly what you just said was that it was my own resistance to the trip that was creating it as a bad trip. And that as soon as I let go of my resistance and said, okay, here we go, death or whatever, it then became this, uh, you know, really amazing um, experience. And, and the surrender itself was the most amazing part of it. And uh, just became a huge lesson about life itself because um, so many of our challenges in life, it seems to me, are about that very thing, resisting, uh, resisting what it is that life wants to show us or what it is that life wants to teach us. And when we can surrender to whatever whatever the experience is, whether it's labeled as good or bad or, you know, uh, beautiful, ugly. Um, if we can surrender to that, that, whatever this is, whatever label we give to it. May I uh, suggest that the, the that could be the experience, the experiential, just like a child, I would see it to being the eyes of an innocent child before four years old. The yeah. children are completely there, 100% engaged in the moment. And something happens somewhere around the age of four and five, and that's taken out of you as humans. But I would, the only thing when you're, I'm listening to you speak about this, it's the only thing I can come up with the example would be the eyes of a child, the innocence, the purity. Yeah. the experiential in that moment that is so alive and so beautiful. You're so right and we and we pick up these stories about you know we start out as far as I can tell with a very very pristine consciousness um, but we gradually uh, first of all form this whole concept of I, the, the I concept you know and um, they actually did a study, the, the telephone company actually did a study at one point to see what word people use the most 
in telephone conversations. And it turned out to be the word I. Uh, so we build up this whole thing and we have stories about this I. You know, I'm, I'm smart or I'm dumb or I'm uh, beautiful or I'm not beautiful or I'm old or I'm young or I'm, uh, I need this or I need that. Or I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Mm. Uh, so and so shouldn't have done that. Uh, the world should be a better place. You know, just on and on and on and on with these various stories, which then take away from our direct perception of reality, our, our being present to, and you might say surrendered to, uh, whatever, whatever that presence is. If we're instead involved with the story of uh, what's going on, then we're seeing through the lens of that story instead of seeing and experiencing and perceiving directly. Yes. And what Even I though it looks like, you know, it looks like yeah. we're all here, here we are all the time. Um, but if we're involved with our stories, picking, picking them up, and something that might be worth saying about stories is that um, they're going to happen. You know, the mind produces stories just in the way that clouds produce rain. You know, they're there. The question is, do we identify with those stories? Do we pick them up? Do we grab onto them? Do, they, do we clutch at them? Do we think that they're actually who we are? As opposed to, I forget who used this analogy, but uh, um, somebody used it. Somebody very bright used it. Uh, they said, you know, we tend to identify with the cherries in the bowl when actually we are the bowl itself in which all those stories and experiences and what have you are taking place. That's a beautiful analogy, absolutely. Let's imagine what it'd be like to be in that state and walking around and meeting up with other human beings as we're walking around in a shopping mall or in the grocery store doing our chores instead of basically seeing that we are separate and it's it's I and and them the others what would it be like I mean it would, the world would be so incredible we'd be fully engaged in that moment and we'd be getting the same thing done that we are wanting to do the, the function of whatever is going on but there'd be so much more the life would be so much more aliveness to it to be living thing. that way. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work lately on uh, the planet mm -hmm. and the perils that the planet is in and um, what might be able to be done and what some of the general principles are that a sustainable planet might operate by. But I'm coming to the conclusion that if humanity is really going to make it, uh, and I think there is some doubt about that, uh, if, if we really look into what's going on, um, there could be some doubt about that. If we, I think at some point, humanity, we're going to have to come together in a way that our consciousness is um, more present. And I think what's going to do that is the very things that we now see as such problems. I'm reminded of Shakespeare's King Lear, the play. Mm -hmm. uh, in that play, King Lear starts out here. And all through the play, on an external level, he's going down, 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 down. You know, by the middle of the play, he's homeless. By the end of the play, his favorite daughter has died. He starts out from this all-powerful, absolute king. And the whole play is simply externally He's simply going like this, down, 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 the whole play. But internally, because of that very movement, down, he's going up. He's going up and up and up and up spiritually and in his compassion and so forth, all through the play, which he never would have done but for this downward movement, because he was too arrogant, too powerful, too closed. Nothing was ever going to penetrate. But that downward movement opened him up, 
him up in a way that nothing else could have. And he really is, is climbing spiritually and heart-wise all through the play. And I, I wonder sometimes if humanity isn't going to experience something similar. That is, externally it seems our challenges are growing greater by the day, not just in the, you know, in the ecological area, you know, I mean, even if global warming was disproved tomorrow, the planet would still be in grave peril. I mean, everything from loss of species, loss of biodiversity, um, water, food, uh, the acidific storage. Yes, yes. Uh, the acidification of the oceans, desertification, deforestation, I mean, just on and on and on, not to mention the financial uh, situation, which is, uh, you know, we've got these huge financial debt bubbles that have been blown and what happens there and um, geopolitically it reminds me very much of the situation just before World War I where all these countries were arming themselves to the teeth and talking about peace. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me an answer of what we're speaking about here is it's an individual call. It's a call to each and every person to own their own energy. And then through owning their own energy, there's possibility of connecting to others to extend that. And it, it, I guess I'm talking about utopia. And when we speak like this, people say, well, that's utopia. That, doesn't, that can't exist here. We're in a place that exploits and through commerce and what we do, and I say no, you could still have it in the same commerce or even a better commerce going on, but yet you could have this, you could have so much more. I, you know, this will sound strange, but um, I've actually kind of fallen in love with this whole reality planet just as it is not in a, some sort of perfect way. I mean, I, love is always imperfect, you know, unless it's divine. We call it divine love because, you know, it's, it's uh, so unconditional. And, you know, human love will always have, I guess, some conditions to it. But um, it seems to me that in some strange way, the utopia is already present if we can tune into it. And how can I say that? Because I'm perfectly aware that there's murder, there's violence, there's war, there's rape, there's poverty, there's hunger, there's, you know, all these things are going on. So how can I possibly say that? I say it because I become aware that <clears throat> reality has to apparently exist as a duality. You know, when a, um, when a particle pops into existence out of the void, physics has established this now, that particles always come in as pairs. Like if, a, if an electron pops into existence from the void, an anti-electron, a positron, pops into existence at the same time. They always come in as a pair. And if they collide, they go out of existence as a pair. Um, and I've noticed that everything has this dual nature. <clears throat> uh, for instance, let's say we get in a car and we go drive a car somewhere. Um, the car gets us where we want to go. Um, that's certainly a plus, that's a positive. Uh, it gets us to work, it gets us to the beach, it gets us to a picnic, it gets us to go see our friend, you know, all sorts of positive things come out of this. At the very same time, it opens us up to the possibility of having an accident, uh, maiming or injuring or killing other people or injuring or killing ourselves. And I noticed the two can't be separated. As soon as we get in that car to experience the positive aspects of it, the potential negative aspects are also there at the very same time and can't be separated from that experience. Same thing, having a body is 
a positive experience. We get to see our friends. We get to see a sunset. We get to listen to music. We get to, you know, do all sorts of, eat our meals, you know, everything that we can enjoy about having a body. At the same time, having a body opens us up to getting sick, getting ill, um, pain, suffering, death, things like that. And it can't be separated. Once you have a body, you have the potential of all these positive things. And you also have the potential of all these negative things. And those two potentials can't be separated. They come as a package deal. And I eventually came to the conclusion that perhaps reality itself is a package deal and can't exist except as a package deal. And, and so that these dualities, what we call the good, the bad, the right, the wrong, the beautiful, the ugly, I noticed that the very language itself from the mind comes in as dualities. Like if, if we create the concept of up, at the very same moment the concept of down comes into being because the two have no meaning without each other. If we create the concept of hot, we've simultaneously created the concept of cold because the two have no meaning without each other. In so, the same way... So let's take this a little bit further. Uh, essentially what you're saying is through the acceptance of the, the two opposites. So how do we apply this to our everyday living as humans that no matter what happens, as it happens, we label it, whether it's a good experience or a bad experience, we go through it, but it's really not of, of attaching to that of what happens. And right. knowing that the opposites could happen at any given moment in time, but not being so attached to everything of the outcomes of what's actually happening. And it really, it really gets back to again, of just we're in this incredible grand absolute experience all the time. It's a never ending experience. And, and it's happening at every given nano moment. Yes. It's not just an occasional thing happening. Life is consistently offering its, its greatest possibilities. And, and as you say, it, it's already there. Utopia is there. Joy is all around us. It's where we put our attention. Um, it's our mind that labels, you know, what happens is what happens. And reality just is what it is. And our mind comes in and says, um, I like this, I don't like that. This should, I agree with this, but I don't agree with that. Um, I like this person's qualities here, but I don't like those qualities. Um, this should be happening, but that shouldn't be happening. Uh, the world should have these qualities, but not these qualities. And all of those, in effect, uh, going back to the earlier part of the conversation, are stories about how reality should be. And uh, a good friend of mine uses an analogy. Uh, she says, um, we come out of this vast, vast, vast thing, whatever it is, it's, it's vast, way vast. And then this little three pound brain turns around and faces this vast process, whatever it is, and says, oh, yeah, I, I, you got it right, sort of, kind of, but let me fix this part for you. No. Maybe not, maybe, it, whatever that is, whatever our label for that is, maybe it knows more than we do about what should be happening and about how things should look and about how whole this, this whole process that we call life should be working, should be happening. I had a lucid dream a number of months ago and I was thinking for weeks and weeks, pondering on it daily. What is it like? What would it be like to be as Jesus Christ, for instance, of living in this world and being in unconditional love? And I kept pondering on it for many days, and I couldn't come up with any answers that made any sense. 
So I do a lot of lucid dreaming. And I had this incredible dream. It was a place, a town, a lot like Berkeley. And I was walking down the middle of the sidewalk and people were partying on either side of me. They were very colorful people, very uh, East Indian, Jamaicans, uh, all kinds of different races. And usually my mind, as you say, in society I'm out and I'm looking at the person saying, okay, she's beautiful, she's not so beautiful, oh, she's wealthy, he's wealthy, mm -hmm. he's not, that's a poor slob, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That's my mind, perhaps, at different times. Not all the time, but certain times. But in this lucid dreaming, it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it was the answer. And the answer was, basically, I was this pure, pure being of energy. And my heart connected to their heart. And we were actually rejuvenating each other when our eyes met. So through the gazing of the eyes and just nodding and saying hello, as they do in the Midwest or in Chicago or Canada, BC, very friendly cities when people nod and check into each other. So this love was exchanged and this, it was an absolutely an incredible moment in this dream saying, this is what it's like to be alive, completely being alive and not closed down. It was absolutely tremendously beautiful experience of knowing that. So I, for time and time again, I'm out and I'm shopping and doing just mindless things and I meet people, I put that same intention and I walk and I fill myself up with all this love and all this energy that I had experienced in lucid dreaming. I look into their eyes and it seems like people are seeking me out to find my eyes because this energy is coming from me and they need it so badly because they, they're in their emotions of where they're, wherever they're at. And then after they look away, it's as if they're in, they, they, they look and it's an instance, it's, it's feeling like, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we all need it, you know. Yeah. Um, I think a big part of love is gratitude. I notice that in any given situation, I can feel complaint, or I can, my mind can come up with complaint about, you know, it needs this, it needs that, uh, you know, this isn't right, that isn't right, or, um, I can focus on, and so much of what life is for us depends on where we put our attention. You know, where we put our attention, I think, determines just about everything in terms of what our life is experienced as. And I find that gratitude is a really important part of that. It's like we have such gifts all the time, you know, just. If you did nothing but focus on your body, you know, your fingers and your thumbs and your eyes and your, your tongue and your, the whole thing and the, the green trees and, the, you know, I mean, if you start making a list of all the things that we could potentially be grateful for, it's, it's very quickly that we realize it's an infinite list. It's an infinite list. And may I add that even the bad as you say, the duality. I mean, how could you say it that you hear you got cancer and you're embracing this? And some of the most incredible women and men that I have met, the most beautiful people have been with cancer, yeah. perhaps. And they're at this place where they're at the other side. They're completely engaged in their presence. They're completely engaged where they're, they're affected, but they're not affected by that their circumstances, up. and there's so much energy pouring from their eyes of being in this presence, right in the here and the now, as their possibly death is upon them. I've thought for a long time now that death is one of the greatest teachers, or the approach of death mm. is one of the greatest teachers, because it separates out the wheat from the chaff right away. You know, you can't afford to hang out with too much of the of the complaints or the shallow this or that you know it's like oh I'm dying now of course we're all dying this is the question of when but um, 
if we keep in mind the fact that we're going to die. This sounds, again, very strange, you know, keep in mind death. You know, how to be happy. Oh, keep in mind death. But the it's, duality. it's yeah. um, when we keep in mind our mortality, the fact that we're only here for a little while, it does tend to separate out the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, it and sobers it, us to our reality of living. That's, yeah. The Buddhist monks, they actually sit in the cemeteries and right, right. meditate on death. And it does tend to lead to yeah. gratitude. Death, the, the, yeah. the remembrance of death tends to lead to gratitude for all that we do have right now. And as the Dalai Lama pointed out, gratitude's one, one half of love one wing of the bird, and the other wing is compassion, where, um, you know, we really see somebody without all the stories about whatever, and just are present with them, not trying to fix them, not trying to heal them, not trying to do anything, just being there with them, I think, is the greatest healing in many ways. Right. But when we speak about compassion there, the Dalai Lama must also mention there's wisdom there. And what is all that about? I mean, it's one thing to really feel compassion and then walk away as you see a homeless person on the street and you feel that moment of compassion. But wisdom needs to come into play. And what is wisdom? What is this all about? How can you help that person? How could you help in that situation? Which would be the best way to give the antidote to that of what is happening and to have the intelligence and the insight and foresight to understand all of that as it's happening. Uh, here in society, a lot of what's going on in, the, in these times is that we look away. We get nervous, actually. And I find that people really don't want the money. They just want to see that somebody actually sees them that's the biggest thing. So I go over and I give a big hug, right? and I ask them, I say, "May I give you a hug?" And they, "Oh yeah, yeah, oh yes, of course, it's okay." And they take this hug and they start crying because they somebody has actually seen them and acknowledged them because that person could could be us, any one of us. There's Absolutely. a three degree separation of yeah. them and us, and there really is no them and us at all. Yeah, and like perhaps an ultimate it. truth is that um, this whole concept that we are separate beings, separate people, mm -hmm. may ultimately be a fiction. That was one of the Buddha's great insights when he woke up was anatta, no self. He realized that um, we build up this whole concept of the self through incessant thought about ourselves. But um, what he realized was that um, at the deepest level, there was no separate entity living a personal life, making personal decisions. All that was a fiction. And that there was just this oneness. You know, in church, many times we've heard the phrase, God is one. God is one. God is love. God is one. If the flip side of that is that um, the personal self is a fiction, is not actually, or, or to put it another way, as Ramana Maharshi phrased it, who we think we are, who we identify as, is not actually who we are. Who we are is the spaciousness. It's just the spaciousness in which all those things, the, the beliefs, the emotions, the stories, the experiences are taking place. And from that spaciousness, then uh, one is more able to hear the, and I'm not claiming any you know, accomplishments of any kind like that, but I, I can say that I've gotten fairly good at following the inner guidance or the inner guide. And the intuition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although I do think of it as kind of deeper than intuition, it, because it taps into something that 
just seems to know just about everything. Well, describe that, what you're tapping into. What would that be like? Because we have a lot of cynics out here. Yeah, and yeah. we have a lot of people yeah, that yeah. are atheists. Which, you know, atheists. So they're going to be listening to you and they're going to say, well, okay, I don't I mean. Yeah, and I know. have a scientific background. I was going to be a scientist at one time. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm the original skeptic. So I actually experimented with that whole thing for a while. You know, it's like, what is the inner guidance? How do you tell the inner guidance from just some other, all the other voices going on in your head? Uh, what, how, you know, what is that like? And, and what happens if you follow it? What happens if you don't follow it? You know, I actually, the scientist in me wanted to, wanted to know. Well, so. What is that like, Jim? What, what is, it, is it, do you register it in your body somewhere? Or is it just an all-knowing in the mind? Or do you feel it in your body, a certain part in your body of these well, thoughts? Here's a big clue. Yes. Uh, I went out to Hawaii one time to attend this two-week uh, seminar. And... Uh, uh, but I had a failing business at the time, and uh, so I took the, the basically the last money I had, and I, I said I need to get you know this seminar to which was going to help me, you know, get my business back on track. So I went out to this thing, and um, I realized pretty quickly that it, it wasn't the right thing. You know, I mean it would. Uh, it was a great seminar for many people, and I don't want to put it down in any way, and he's a great teacher in many ways. And it was your last money, so you yeah. really needed that money. Yeah, so. yeah. But there I am, <laughs> and I realized for me in that particular moment of my life and my situation, it wasn't the right thing. But then my mind came in, and the mind is a very good lawyer, right? So the mind came in and said, but yeah, but you've spent this money. Here you are. Uh, you know, stick it out a little bit. You haven't really given it a chance. You know, come on, Jimmy. I mean, you know, don't cut and run here. Just hang with it, you know. So the second day, and I hung with it, and I still, you know, was getting this, it's not really the right thing for me at this time in my life. You know, maybe next year it'll be, it'll be the right thing, but not right now. But then the other part comes in and says, well, you know, but you know, here you are, the money's spent, stick it out, blah, blah, blah. So this goes on back and forth, tug of war, back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, um, I think it was Ben Franklin who said, you know, put the sheet, draw the line down the middle of the sheet, put the pros on the left-hand side, put the cons on the right-hand side, and, you know, whichever list is longer, that's the way to go. And I did that, and I was still going back and forth in tension, third day, fourth day, at the beginning of the fifth day, I sat down and I said, okay, I'm just going to see, you know, and, and I hardly was aware of inner guidance at that time. I was just beginning to, you know, get a sense of it. This was a couple of decades ago, maybe three decades ago. Uh, so I sat down and I had a big pad of paper with me, and, and I was going to write down page after page after page after page, whatever my inner guidance said. And so there I, I sat there and I said, okay, tell me what I need to know. What should I do here? And I was prepared to write this whole essay, whatever it was. And what happened instead was one word formed on the page that was six inches high, one word. And it said, go, that's all. And I, I immediately made the decision to leave and all the tension left my body and I realized I was doing the right thing. So one of the ways we can recognize the inner guidance uh, that I've come to know is that it's not wordy. It doesn't write essays. It's very brief. It's very pithy. It's very to the point. It'll sometimes be one word or just a few words or a sentence maybe, but that's it. It's, it's, it doesn't explain itself. It doesn't 
It's not coming from any kind of fear whatsoever. It's not even particularly interested in your personal well-being, although it's certainly not against that. But it does tend to, what it suggests, does tend to lead to, tend to lead to the most harmonious result for all concerned. But one of the ways you recognize it is that brevity. It's, it's very brief and it doesn't explain and it's always coming from tremendous love uh, and a total absence of fear, total absence of fear. And it's very quiet. It doesn't insist at all. If, if it makes a suggestion and you ignore that, it just waits. It just waits. And the other thing is, it doesn't say no. It only says yes. Its way of saying no is, it simply doesn't say anything. So, give you an example. If you've ever been, uh, have you ever had a word on the tip of your tongue? And you're looking for a word. And, you know, your friends might say, well, what about this word? And you say, yeah, yeah, that's kind of it, yeah. And some other friend says, well, what about this word? You know, yeah, yeah, that's kind of it, yeah. And then somebody else says another word, and you go, yes, that's it. Well, that's what the inner guidance is like. It's either full on, 100%, or nothing. It's never prevaricating. It's never going back and forth. It's, it's, it's just either fully on, do this, and it's, it, it's like, call this person, go here now, do this, just like that. Yeah, it sounds like a, the absolute knowing yeah. of something. And yeah, it's... it has access to whatever it is, and God knows, um, it has access, to, it knows way more than, than we do. Than, than this does. What would be your thoughts if you were to say of one thing that you would want to share with others that would be the most important one thing that would really, really serve them and help them? And what would that one thing be? From your perspective of writing this book, a handbook There's, for humans. What, just draw one thing out of there that would be... I find questions to be very useful in all kinds of circumstances for all kinds of people, no matter what our particular evolution might be or what our particular consciousness might be. Questions are extremely helpful. Which equals curiosity. Yeah. The curiosity to me equals intelligence. In other words, um, you can say something as simple as, how can I solve this problem? Or, and the mind will give you, if you say, um, why am I screwed up? The mind will give you an answer. If you say, how come I'm always failing? The mind will give you an answer. If you say, how can I improve this situation? The mind will give you, or whatever, will give you an answer. Um, how can I be happy? And I find what's really valuable is not to go for the quick answer. Like if you ask yourself a question, how can I be happy? Well, each person might have their own particular answer to that question. And I find what's most valuable is to pose a really interesting question, like um, how can I be happy? Or um, how can I serve at the highest level right now? or um, be something as simple as how can I make more money or how can I feed my children or uh, how can I live the most meaningful life or whatever. Um, and then the valuable thing is to hang with the question, not just accept whatever answer comes from mind right away, but to wait and let a deep answer emerge. And sometimes with a really deep question, it can take weeks or months or years for that answer to occur. But the very 
hanging with the question uh, leads you to all kinds of places that are extremely valuable. Just hanging with the question and sometimes you get more than one answer. Over time the answer can even change. But what I like about it is that it can be done by anybody under any circumstance at any stage of life we can ask a good question and just hang with that question and let the answer emerge from some deep place, from the inner guidance. Okay. How do we know if it's not coming from a place of emotions, on an emotional level that has really dictated and ruled our way of thinking up until that point in time? How will we really know the absolute that that's it of this beautiful way that you're speaking about. One of the things about the inner guidance is it is when it, it feels right. It, it has a sense of like a, a key going into a lock or aligning with the river. Or, you know, as the river is going downstream, instead of fighting upstream and trying to go up the river, you know, suddenly it feels like, oh, I'm just going down the river. And one of the qualities too is that we become unattached to the outcome. Unattached to the outcome. There's a, remember the Bhagavad Gita? Yes. Yeah. And uh, Arjuna, the great warrior, is about to fight a battle. And um, he's conflicted because some of his friends are on the other side. And fortunately, he has Krishna, the Lord of all, uh, right next to him there. And so he says to Krishna, what should I do here? And Krishna's answer, and I'm boiling it down basically, but his answer is very famous. It was that, do the very best you can do with the role that fate has assigned to you, but leave the outcome to me. Don't be attached to the outcome. Do the best you can do, whatever it is, and then leave the outcome to the universe. Don't be concerned about it. And following the inner guidance feels that way. It feels like, okay, I'm going to take this direction, I'm going to do this, whatever it is. But it does carry with it a letting go of the outcome because something larger than ourselves, whatever label we want to give that, is in charge of the outcome. I'm sure that a lot of people who are listening to you and I speaking right now are thinking that I'd love to do that, but their brain is in a very skeptical state of being. They're consumed with knowing and thinking that they are controlling everything and everything that you and I are talking about right now is maybe for others but not for them. How do we push the envelope a little bit more and what would be your final thoughts and words on how to address that for these people that just say oh my god what is he talking about what is she talking about it, it, it's, it's just that's not me and that could never be me I am in control of everything here meanwhile if they were to look at their lives they would see that they're not and the state of their lives and their and their unhappiness and their the conflict that's going on and what have you. It's basically they're really not taking responsibility, but they think they are taking responsibility. So let's just have some final words on this in closing, what you would say to that, to these people. One of the great ahas for me, and I've had many challenges in my life. I'm, you know, I have not been one of these people that just has glided through life and, you know, no problems, no challenges. Um, so I'm right down there in the trenches with everybody else. And, but uh, a, a big aha that I did have was that I'm not in control. I'm not in control. I'm not who I thought I was. It's all happening by itself. And the difference between me and my cat is you know, it's all happening by myself. Uh, it's all happening by itself. 
but I have a voiceover saying, I did it, I'm doing it, you know. I'm building the empire, or I made this mistake here, or whatever that might be. Um, I realized I'm not in control, that this enormous process, this magnificent process called life on Earth, and life in the universe, and reality, is happening by itself. It is being done as we are speaking. We don't, our heart is beating. We don't have to be concerned about it. We're, while we're, you know, going back and forth, our breathing is taking place. We don't have to keep remembering to breathe. And maybe it's just possible that everything's like that, that it's all being handled if we can let it. It doesn't mean we don't do the best we can, you know, in our limited knowledge, in our limited capabilities, with whatever we've got, whatever resources we have, we do the best we can. It doesn't mean we, you know, sit around on the couch and wait for somebody to show up at the door with a check. We do the very best we can in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. But in the, in the knowledge at the same time, or the knowing at the same time, that actually it's all happening by itself. It's, it is, to, whatever that it is, whatever label we want to give that incomprehensibility, that, that unknowing, that the unknowable, it's actually doing everything. It's doing everything and it knows what it's doing. It knows what it's doing. So we can trust the process. Even if I walk outside of here and I die of a heart attack, I can trust the process. It's what's supposed to happen. The ultimate surrender. Yeah. Jim, it's been an absolute pleasure and a delight and an honor to speak with you. And thank you so much for writing this book. A handbook for humans finally was, has been written. Thank you. Well, an attempt anyway. Thank you so much for Absolutely. having me on. I, I really, really appreciate it. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.